that is. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11, we'll begin reading here in just a moment in verse number 17. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 17 is where we will begin reading. This morning, I would like to preach a message entitled, The Only Begotten Sons, plural. We all know that there is one son in the Bible referred to as the only begotten son. You know his name well. We sang about his name earlier in the service. The choir did such a beautiful job singing about the name of Jesus. He is the only begotten son of God. In fact, he's mentioned as the only begotten son three times in your Bible. Perhaps we all know the most popular place which he is described this way. It's in the third chapter of John, verse number 16. And I would dare say uh, that many of you would be able to join me in quoting that verse this morning. Would you please? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the second time that Jesus is described as the only begotten Son. The very first time that He's described as the only begotten Son, it's in the same Gospel, the Gospel of John, chapter number 1, and verse number 18, and the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. The last time that Jesus is described this way as the only begotten Son is also under the divine authorship of the Apostle John and under inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 John chapter number 4, verse 9. The Bible says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Now, I will say this, it is one thing for someone to say, I love you. It's another thing entirely for someone to show it. That's what the word manifest means. It means not just to say, I love you, but to put it on display, to do something that demonstrates that love and that purchase of love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. But yet I am not preaching just on the only begotten Son. I am preaching on the only begotten sons. For there is one other man in all of Scripture that is described in the exact same way as the only begotten Son. And that man is mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 11, here in verse number 17. And the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Father, you don't do anything by accident, especially in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit. Lord, that you would remove all distractions and that you would rest on this place in your power And Father, we would understand the significance of what you're saying in your word. Help me, I need you, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. The very last phrase of verse number 17. His only begotten Son. No other place in the entire Bible, no other man in the entire Bible has a relationship, a similarity, or if I could say, a kinship with the Lord Jesus Christ as Isaac does. For Isaac is the only one described 
also as an only begotten son. And as you study the life of Isaac and the life of Jesus, you find a myriad of similarities and parallels. In fact, um, in my study, I was able to find um, 30 different parallels just in the sacrifice of Isaac alone, not to mention um, other things as well. Uh, For example, are you aware of the fact that both Jesus and Isaac are sons of Abraham? Uh, For without the lineage of Abraham, you would not have had Mary, you would not have had Joseph, therefore you would not have had Jesus in the way that he has described and prophesied about in the Bible. Wow, there are so many similarities regarding Isaac and Jesus. If I could rehearse just a few of those by way of introduction here this morning, uh, the first one is this, that both Jesus and Isaac, both of them were peculiar sons. They were peculiar sons. Uh, They were both fathers of other children, Abraham was, and God the Father was. They're both described as the only begotten son and not the one and only son in this passage. In fact, it would be true to say of Father Abraham, and it has been sung about for a millennium of vacation Bible school kids, that Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, spin around, sit down. Oh yeah, nod your head, turn around, and all of those charismatic things. It would be safe to say that Isaac was not the only son of Abraham. In fact, Isaac also had a brother that was a biological son of Abraham, but yet here in Hebrews chapter number 11, Ishmael is not described as the only begotten son. You see, that word begotten means something. You can't remove it and have the same thing that you have with it inserted. That word word begotten means one of a kind. It means of a special kinship to the father. And even though Ishmael could claim that Abraham was his son, only Isaac could claim that he was the one of a kind promised son of Abraham. And in the same way, I think that it would be fair to admit that the father upon high, the Lord God Almighty, has many sons. The Bible says to as many as received him, Jesus to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. And we can stand here today, or sit here today, stand up if you want, and shout the fact that we are sons of God and that we are joint heirs with Christ, that Jesus, he is our brother in Christ, and that we have a heavenly father and we are his children. But there's only one only begotten son and that's Jesus Christ he and he alone has that unique kinship that he is of the father of the same type of the father we cannot claim that we are 100% man and 100% God but Jesus was not just a son in terms of his 100% humanity but also a son in the fact that he was 100% deity you see both Isaac and Jesus were peculiar sons They weren't just peculiar sons, they were promised sons. There was a promise made to an old, aged man by the name of Abraham and his wife Sarah, and they thought that they were well beyond child-rearing years, and quite frankly, they were. But there was a promise made. There was a promise made that from Abraham would come many nations, and you can't have many nations without having A son. And God was going to fulfill his promise. You see, God is not slack concerning his promises, which means anything that God promises will come to reality. And although Sarah may have laughed and Abraham may have doubted when they first heard the word that not only were they going to have uh, nations, but they were going to have a precious promised son. And they may have doubted in those years of barrenness. But one day, Sarah came in and said, something's up, something's going on. 
1, for she was with child, and Isaac was a promised son. And in the same way, Jesus Christ was a promised son. He was promised first to Adam and Eve, that by Eve's seed, that son of, of, of Eve would squash, uh, would crush Satan's head. He was promised to Abraham uh, that a Messiah would come. He was promised to David that a king would sit on David's throne, which would last forever and ever and ever. A promise was made to John the Baptist that the Messiah would come, and John said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that promise came to fruition when John said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And a promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You see, Abraham, or Isaac and Jesus, they were peculiar sons. They were promised sons. They were also provided sons. They were provided miraculously. Abraham and Sarah, well beyond years, and yet a miraculous event occurred. Uh, Mary, having never known a man, conceived of the Holy Ghost, and Jesus was born of a virgin. It was a miraculous birth, and in that sense, uh, they, were, they were provided sons. They're promised sons. They're peculiar sons. But they were powerful sons. And the Bible says in verse number 18 concerning Isaac, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. You see, whenever God makes a promise, He supplies the power in order to bring that promise to fruition or to reality. And that power was placed in Isaac. For without Isaac, you don't have Jacob. Without Jacob, there is no Israel. Without Israel, you don't have Judah. Without Judah, you don't have David. Without David, you don't have Jesus. You see where I'm getting at here. When God wants to fulfill His promise, He empowers His people in order to fulfill that. And that empowerment of Abraham's promised seed rested solely on the shoulders of Isaac. Um, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That's like God pointing down His finger right at Isaac and say, you're the one, boy. You're the one that I'm going to entrust my promise with. You're the one that I'm going to empower ensure, to ensure that, that my purpose is fulfilled. And no doubt, the Lord Jesus Christ was a powerful son. For God made a promise to all of humanity that one day sin would be atoned for. One day there would be a sacrifice that would end all sacrifices that would pay for the sins of man, or the sins of their past and their present and their future. And that was realized in Jesus Christ and who God calls to fulfill his promise. God empowers to, co to keep that promise. And Jesus spread his arms on Calvary and says, all power is given me in heaven and in earth. He was a powerful son. Whew. You see, I could go on and on and on and on. You know, I could tell you about how both Abraham and Isaac both Abraham and Isaac, they were led to their sacrifice by their father. Oh, there's so many similarities. I could preach for the rest of the day just on these similarities. I'm going to try to discipline myself not to. But you remember the, the story of Abraham and Isaac, how Abraham took Isaac uh, to the top of that mountain under command of God. God said to sacrifice your son. Abraham woke up early in the morning Isaac out of bed, get the donkey and some wood, his fire, his knife. He said, come on, boy, we've got to go. What are we doing, Dad? We've got to make a sacrifice. Where's the lamb? For three days they, they travel until God makes it known that's the mountain. Imagine Abraham's heart sinks. He says, come on, Isaac. We've got to go to the top. And the Bible says in Genesis 22, 3, that Abraham rose up early and went unto the place which God had told him. And he brought Isaac along. You see, both Isaac and Jesus were led to the place of sacrifice by their father. Father. 
Jesus says, I came not to do my will, but the will of the Father which sent me. And just as Abraham grabbed hold of Isaac's hand and took him to the top of that mountain, the Father, uh, after Jesus agonizing in the garden, saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And I can see the hand of the Father saying, this way, my son, we've got to climb this mountain. We've got to go to the top of this hill. And at the top of that hill, it was their fathers which brought them there. Moreover, both of them carried the wood for their sacrifice. Genesis 22, verse number 6 says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And Isaac shouldered that bundle of wood and began to walk up the mountain with the weight of it on his shoulders, realizing that it was about to be the weight of that wood that would then support his body as his father lays him down on it. And yet the Bible also says this in John chapter number 19, verse number 17, and he bearing his cross went forth unto a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And I can see that bloodied and persecuted lamb of God shouldering his own boards of wood as he made his way to Golgotha before they called Simon of Cyrene. It was the bloody feet of Jesus Christ uh, which stepped forward carrying that wood that he would one day, uh, that he would soon be nailed to just as Isaac carried that wood which he would soon be laid upon. Both were submissive to their father's will. And I believe that both believed in the resurrection. Look with me at verse number 19. The Bible says concerning Abraham, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And it is my belief, uh, not just because I believe it, but because God said it, uh, that God believed uh, that if he were to go up there and to kill his only begotten son, Isaac, that God had the power and would fulfill his promise by raising up his son, Isaac. You say, well, I'm not so sure about that. What if I were to go back to Genesis 22 and examine it? You go right ahead and you'll find out this, that the last words to the servant from Abraham was, hey, we are coming back. And it's in the plural, as if to say, me and Isaac, both, we're coming back. I am not coming back without my son. And why did he say that? Because he believed, not that he wouldn't have to sacrifice him, but he believed that God would raise him up. And I believe that the Heavenly Father was fully aware that Jesus Christ was going to pay the full measure of sacrifice for our sin would be pierced in his hands and his feet. That spear would roll through his side. But yet three days later, that stone was going to get rolled away. Jesus was going to come out and up from the grave he arose. And I want you to know this, that that is part of the promise that we too who will die have this blessed hope that one day we too will raise from the dead just as Christ was raised from the dead. Those that are forgiven our sins, we don't have to sorrow is those who have no hope but rather there is an eternal home in glory prepared for us streets mansion lawn that are waiting with our name on it if you receive Christ as your savior see there are so many similarities between Isaac and Jesus I could keep preaching. I got a whole list of them here, but I'll spare you because I know it's 1152 and you can't pay attention past noon. So I got eight minutes. I'm going to ask the Lord to hold the sun still in the sky. Because as many similarities as there are between Isaac and Jesus, the whole point of the book of Hebrews is to show that Jesus is greater. (laughs) That Jesus is greater. That Jesus went farther. That Jesus did more than any man that anything could ever do. And I've narrowed the list for your sake and mine this morning to three areas in which Jesus went 
farther. And despite all the similarities, the sacrifice of Isaac doesn't even come close. The first one is this. Abraham's offering was because of a command. (laughs) God's offering is because of compassion. You see, when you do things out of a command, you're doing because somebody told you to. I don't think that Abraham ever prayed for this. I don't think Abraham ever desired this. It wasn't in his heart. But he was commanded to do it. And he did the best that he could with the command. He obeyed it. Just as you and I should obey every command that that God has given us. Obey every command. But yet he did not ask for it. He rose up early in the morning because that's what God said to do. He took his son Isaac because that's what God said to do. He went up on that mountain because that's what God said to do. He expressed his full measure of faith and obedience. But you know, there is a difference between doing something because someone told you to and doing something because you have an immense love for someone else. And even though Abraham operated out of a command, God's action was based on a desire. It was based on compassion. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Abraham woke up that morning with fear and trepidation. I could imagine each step up Mount Moriah with Isaac by his side. I imagine it being taken in complete silence and with a bit of fear of what's going to happen. But not so with God. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse number 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He goes on in Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 2. He says that God viewed the sacrifice of Christ as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Sweet-smelling savor. I would walk through a garden in the coolness of the morning and see a rose and to smell its scent. There's nothing like it. But the only thing as good as smelling a rose is chocolate chip cookies. You just crack the door of your house and you walk in and the aroma is intoxicating. You're having a bad day and then all of a sudden, ooh, we're okay now. I'm not talking about the stuff that y'all buy at Food City and Kroger and pop in the microwave and come out and it's kind of soft. I'm talking about warm, gooey goodness. I'm talking about stuff made with sugar and butter. I'm talking about the kind where when you, when you pull it apart, the chocolate strings together and melts down to the floor and you get in trouble for making a mess. I'm talking about the kind of cookies so warm, so delicious, so wonderful that after you eat them and you try to lie and say you didn't, you don't get away with it because it's all over your face. And you come into a house after fresh, homemade cookies just been baked. Your whole world just got great. I was once watching a show on HGTV. Not because I had compassion for it, but because I was commanded to it. And I'm watching this show. I'm watching this show and they're talking about things that you can do to stage your house and sell your home. Um, One recommendation that was made just before open house Bake some cookies. Why? Because when people smell baked goods, they just want to spend money. They just feel good about it. And I'm telling you, when I smell... Let's just close the service and go get some cookies. All right. Hey, when I smell that, it smells good. And this is exactly how the Father describes the sacrifice of Jesus. See, Abraham was commanded... God did it because 
because he knew the value of what he was purchasing. And friends, that's me and that's you. For God so loved us so much, so severely, so flagrantly, so amazingly that he sacrificed his own son and says, this is a sweet smelling savor. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And yes, Jesus and Isaac, they may have a lot of parallels. They may have a lot of similarities. But one massive difference which shows me that Jesus is greater and better is that Abraham Abraham's offering was a result of a command, but Jesus' offering was because of compassion. Another thing I see in reality is that to, to some degree it's an unfair comparison, these two. Because you see, Isaac was spared, whereas Jesus was sacrificed. Isaac carries the wood as Jesus carried the wood. The father prepared the sacrifice, and the father prepared the sacrifice. The father was ready to plunge the knife. But in Isaac's case, he was stopped, wasn't he? And Isaac was spared. I've often tried to place myself behind the eyes of each of these characters, Abraham and Isaac. I don't know exactly where the eyes of Abraham were looking. Perhaps a um, closer examination of Genesis 22 would help me with that. Was he looking at Isaac as he was about to plunge that knife into his own son? Was he looking to the father hoping that there would be a last moment cry for help? Or was he just shielding his eyes from the reality of what was about to take place? I do not know where the eyes of Abraham were. But I do know that those eyes immediately searched heavenward as he heard that voice to stop. Stop. Don't do it. And the fact is that Isaac was never sacrificed. Oh, but when I get behind the eyes of Isaac, oh, it looks incredibly different. Hands bound and feet bound on this uncomfortable wood. Looking upward at that father who loves me and here comes the knife. And yet that knife stops. And his arms of a loving father pull him off of that altar as Abraham begins to explain. The Lord's provided something else. And Abraham still, or and Isaac still bound, looks over at what Abraham's pointing out. He says, look, God has provided a ram caught in the thicket. And, and I'm looking over there thinking, hallelujah, kill that thing and throw him on the altar. <laughs> that knife that was intended for my flesh oh, now frees my hands and my feet. And I'm rejoicing. I'm hugging daddy's neck. And I'm saying, thank you, Lord. As I see Abraham go over just as quick as could be and wrestle that ram out of the, out of the thicket and wrestle that, that ram uh, over to the altar. And that same knife uh, that was intended to me plunges into that ram. And immediately as I'm watching the blood pour out of this animal, I think, that should have been me. As I see that dead animal turned over and cut open for the guts to be pulled out, I think, that should have been me. As I see this creature filleted open, dripping with blood, now placed on the altar, lifeless, I think that should have been me. As the fire begins to be put to that wood, and the crackle of that wood grows into a roar as that animal is consumed, I think, that should have been me. As the smell of that burnt flesh enters into my nostrils and I wince at the bitterness of it, I think that should have been me. You see, Isaac was never sacrificed. But when it came to Jesus, he paid the full measure of our sin. You see, for Isaac, there was something put in his place. This ram which was caught in this thicket by his horns. 
And I could imagine this briary bush that the horns were caught in as the ram is maybe struggling against it but unable to go. And I think of the crown of thorns which was placed on our Savior's head that he was not struggling to get away from, but rather he laid his life down willingly that he might become a sacrifice for sin. And as one son, the father's knife was spared, the other son, the father's knife, plunged so deeply And when the son looked for compassion, the father's eyes were turned and he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And let me tell you why. It's because God did not ever want to put himself in a place where he had to forsake you. And when I look at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I look at that blood that was spilt and I think that should have been me. I see the nail pierced hands and I think that should have been me. I see the wrath of an almighty God that is judging the sin that was imputed into Jesus Christ. And I think that should have been me as his body was put in a grave. I think that should have been me as I think of the flames of hell. I think that should have been me. But let me tell you something. It wasn't me. It wasn't Isaac. It wasn't anyone else because there was a lamb, the sinless lamb of God that was sacrificed in our place and his payment was a ransom for many that all could be saved oh yeah there's a lot of similarities between Jesus and Isaac but Isaac was never sacrificed Jesus was Jesus was Abraham's obedience was out of a command Christ was out of compassion The final truth that I would like to point out is simply this. That Abraham believed the promise. Just as we should. That's a great thing. But you know what makes Jesus greater? (laughs) Abraham may have believed the promise. But Jesus. He is the promise. (laughs) He is the promise. The forgiveness of sins. He is the redeemer of all mankind. He is the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And and when I look to verse number 19, I see a peculiar phrase at the end of the verse. It says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And notice this, from whence he ought from whence also he received him in a figure. Uh, For uh, quite a bit of time, I wasn't exactly sure uh, what this was trying to communicate and what it was saying, Uh, but now I I believe I've got a grasp on it. Uh, And the truth is this, in verse 19, it's saying that Abraham was believing that Isaac uh, was able to be raised up from the dead. Even from the dead, it says at the beginning of the verse. Uh, But then it says, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, what is a figure? A, a figure is a, it's a pattern or a representation or a similarity of something else. And even though uh, God did not require the, the death of Isaac, he did come off that mountain with Abraham. And, and I would say, in a sense, God continued to give him life, eternal, so to speak. Uh, he raised him up from the dead, or what Abraham thought he was going to have to do, So in a figure, some things had changed. In a figure, it was like he had raised from the dead. In a figure, he was fulfilling uh, that promise of faith. And Abraham and Isaac may have done that in a figure, in a promise. Uh, God promised this seed, and he wasn't going to go back on his promise. But I will tell you this, Jesus is not some figure. Jesus is not some pattern. Jesus is not some picture. Jesus is the real answer. He is not a substitution uh, for, for some kind of human philosophy. He is the real answer. And by the way, he is the answer to all of life's questions. He's the answer for our eternal life. He's the answer to our temporary struggle. Jesus is the answer. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by 
me. And if you're here this morning and you are looking for some other answer or some other thing, I'm telling you, Jesus is it. He is it. And you may have a lot of things in your life that seem similar to Jesus. A lot of good companions and friends. A lot of people that will do a lot, do a lot for you. But I'm telling you, there is no one like Jesus. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.